They said, the kids are gonna come back. They just ran away. We knew they didn't just run away. This is one of the largest manhunts in the state of Wisconsin. Dave is absolutely relentless. You think it should be solved. You gotta blame somebody. We had to figure out what kind of killer we were dealing with. He exhibited all of the stereotypical signs of a serial killer. When an investigation runs out of leads, it becomes a cold case. Years pass, and hope fades. But for the families of the victims, these cases are never cold. The truth takes time. This is Farm Country, Wisconsin. High school sweethearts Tim Hack and Kelly Drew are at the wedding of a friend. The couple has plans to go to a carnival, so they don't stay long. They have a drink, then disappear into the night. Never to be seen again. We do take this part of Wisconsin for granted. We love the sunrises and the sunsets and the planting and harvesting of crops. Some of us are lucky enough to meet our high school sweetheart and get married. Tim and Kelly started dating in high school. Tim would bring Kelly out to the farm. I thought it was kind of cool that a city girl would come and hang around with a farm boy. They were a good couple. I really do believe that the two of them would eventually be married, that they would be a couple for life. Tim and Kelly were gonna go to a wedding reception at the Concord House. Tim and Kelly get to the Concord House at approximately 10.30 p.m. They're there for approximately half an hour, 45 minutes. Witnesses say that Tim had a beer and Kelly had a soda during the time they were there. And there are witnesses that see them leave The next morning, get up and get work done. Except when you got up in the morning and Tim wasn't there, instantly there was a, a level of concern. If he wasn't gonna come home, he's gonna stay with a friend, you'd call. We called Kelly's mom and said, did they stay there? She said, no. I drove up to the Concord House to look. Tim's car was still there. The door wasn't quite shut, and his wallet was still in the car. And that was not like him to do stuff like that. From there on, we finally realized Tim and Kelly are, are gone. The Sheriff's Department finds cigarettes, checkbook, wallet. There did not appear any sign of a struggle. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. There was some talk, I remember. Uh, did they lope? Did they take a bus someplace? Our kitchen actually became a command post. Dave knows that something's wrong. Something has happened. We need to figure out what happened. If they had run off to Las Vegas and got married, 
they would have called us. They wouldn't have let us sit and worry about them. In the first four days, they were talking to all the employees from the Concord House. We were talking to wedding guests. One consistent thing that was reported was that there was this dark, dirty van that had been in the parking lot. One witness specifically recalled the van taking off you know, sort of in a suspicious fashion, in a quick way. The Concord House itself was right next to the interstate. There's a big parking lot. There's not a lot of lighting or anything out there. If you were intent on abducting somebody, all you had to do is wait for the right moment. We need to find the kids. The community stepped up. All the local farmers were there to help do some searches around the Concord House. They're searching vacant buildings. They're searching everywhere that they can find. Everybody was involved. This is one of the largest manhunts in the state of Wisconsin. Didn't seem real. Nothing seemed real. You know, have two news helicopters landing in the field next to the house. I mean, how real is that? We checked every place we could think of. There was nothing that could lead us to them. A teenager on his tractor had seen something as he was driving that caught his eye. a pair of pants, just like Kelly had been wearing on the night that she disappeared. Both the left and the right leg are completely cut from the ankle all the way up to the waist. And so in other words, the pants could have still been on her body, but they had been cut away. It just magnified what I had thought all along, that someone had definitely raped her. Over the course of 10 days, multiple pieces of clothing belonging to Kelly are found along the roadway within a six mile radius of the Concord House, as well as about a dozen pieces of rope with various knots tied in it. We have very good evidence now but we need Tim and Kelly. Squirrel hunters from Milwaukee are out in the Exonia, Wisconsin area, which is approximately seven miles from the Concord House. While they're walking through a wooded area, they stumble across a body and immediately contact law enforcement. The body was badly decomposed. It's dark out, it's nighttime, so law enforcement sets up a perimeter around this area until daylight. Approximately 100 yards away, they locate a male body. It's fully clothed and appears to be the same clothing that Tim was reported to have been wearing on August 9th, 1980. The manner of death for both of them was homicide. I had the radio on, and they announced over the radio that they had indeed found both bodies. And um, so, I'm gonna tear up. So I remember walking in the kitchen, and the detective is there with my parents telling them that they did indeed find Tim and Kelly. There were ligature marks on Kelly's ankles and wrists that were consistent with having been bound. Kelly was most possibly strangled based on damage and insect activity around the throat area. 
So then these pieces of rope we're finding along the roadsides become extremely significant. There's the regular square knot, but there's also half hitches, clove hitches, bowline knots. This is somebody with knowledge of knot tying, somebody that's been in the Navy or the military or in the trades, like a carpenter, maybe a painter. It's not gonna just be your everyday person that's gonna tie these types of knots. This is a tight-knit community, so the phone calls are coming in, the tips are coming in. There's a tip that comes in from a woman who believes that her husband may have been involved in the murders of Tim and Kelly. This suspect, Mr. James, lived in the area where the bodies were found. He does roofing work, works with ropes. He's known to carry a knife on his belt. He has a van. And on August 10th of 1980, shortly after the disappearance of Tim and Kelly, he has his wife and stepdaughters completely clean out the van. A lot of things are adding up here. This could be the guy that took Tim and Kelly. There were a lot of things that were adding up for Mr. James being our suspect. So a search warrant is obtained to search the property to try to see if they could find anything linking Mr. James to Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. They retrieve clothing that is eerily similar to Kelly's shirt. Both in terms of color and the way that it's torn. They find ropes tied in knots. They find what could be blood. They transport this clothing to the crime lab for testing. As they're conducting a search, they received information from his wife. She said that he's an alcoholic, he's violent. He, according to his wife, had tied her up in the past. And then his wife said that her daughters, his stepdaughters, were being sexually assaulted by him. Officers took him into custody so that he could be questioned in regards to Tim and Kelly. He was questioned at length. He denied any involvement and a polygraph or lie detector test was used on him. Polygraphs aren't admissible at trial, but they do give investigators at least some guidance as to whether a suspect is being truthful. He admits to the sexual assault of his stepdaughters, but denies any knowledge of Tim or Kelly, denies ever meeting them, abducting them, ever being at the Concord house. It was the examiner's determination that Mr. James was being truthful when he denied having any involvement in Tim and Kelly's murders. Mr. James ultimately is convicted of the sexual assault of his stepdaughters and sent away. However, he remains a suspect in this case. I know that my parents and Kelly's parents work together on planning the funerals. They died together. They wanted them to be together eternally. Dave never let it go, because Dave was always uh, searching for justice for Tim. You think it should be solved. You got to blame somebody. We were looking at anything that was going to help solve it.
Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole were a pair of drifters who were arrested on a number of very minor charges. After their apprehension, they started confessing to dozens and dozens of murders. As a result, detectives from all over the country now have to become involved in the investigation to see if any of their cold cases involved Lucas or Toole. What led us to believe that they could be responsible was that they had abducted so many women and men, sexually assaulting them and at times killing them. There were a total of either four or five cases in Wisconsin at that time that were unsolved that could have been them. A serial killer with a drifter lifestyle can leave a trail of bodies, and no one can actually pinpoint them to be in that location at any given time. One of the murders Henry Lee Lucas confessed to was the Orange Socks Drifter. This was a young Jane Doe, unidentified, who was found murdered wearing only orange socks. The Orange Socks Drifter was strangled and raped, very similar to the way Kelly Drew was. Because of the similarities in these crimes, this was a significant motivating factor for detectives to go interview Lucas and Toole. There was optimism. Now it's getting serious. You just had that feeling that they were going to solve this case. Lucas and Toole are confessing to in excess of 300 rapes and homicides that they've done across the country. The reasons that Lucas and Toole might confess to all these crimes might be to gain attention. It might be important for them. Maybe it fed their egos. Our investigator went to interview Lucas and Toole regarding Tim and Kelly. What led investigators to believe that they could be responsible for the murder of Tim and Kelly was that they had committed two separate homicides in Wisconsin. Lucas and Toole had previously admitted to being in Wisconsin, traveling on I-94, very close to where Tim and Kelly disappeared from at the Concord House. And the time frame was around the same time frame as Tim and Kelly's disappearance. You know where this girl's at? I want you to admit to it. They scattered here in about 48 different states. Well, I know. But, uh, but who's going to do it if we don't? How many people did you kill? 150. Investigators and the families believed that the murderer had been found. And it was all that people could talk about was that finally, we know who did it. Investigators established a detailed timeline and find that Lucas and Toole were in Wisconsin in September and October of 1980. However, they were not in Wisconsin in August of 1980. I mean, they certainly were killers, serial killers even, but they were not involved in Tim and Kelly's murders. Tips aren't coming in. All the evidence that has been found has been processed, has been sent in. All the leads that have been developed have pretty much been followed up on. The reality was we weren't making any progress towards identifying a suspect. Eventually, the leads dry up, and the case goes cold. The case remains cold for more than two decades. The Hack family is forced to move on without their oldest son. I sold the family farm. I always felt Tim would eventually take over the farm, but then after they died, it didn't really make any difference anymore because 
It was no longer a family farm. You know, I used to expect Tim and Kelly to be there to run the farm, to run the crops. Um, it just leaves a hole. When I turned 18, my parents gave me Tim's car. And I still have the car. I still drive the car. I still love the car. I just didn't want Tim and Kelly forgotten. A big part of my love for the community is that it's where I grew up. Uh, it's where I'm raising my daughter now. Small towns are safe. You know, you can let your kids out at night and they can play without fear. I was eight years old at the time Tim and Kelly went missing. So when I first was elected district attorney, I was well aware of this case. And I wanted to know what happened to Tim and Kelly. When I got the case, it was 26 years old at that point. Knowing what a big case this was after being unsolved for so long, it immediately became my number one goal to solve this case. I reviewed thousands of pages of reports, attachments, maps, and photos. But in general, there's limited evidence I have to go with. But what I do have was Kelly's clothes. At that time, DNA is becoming more and more popular. Oh, and that was something that wasn't available to law enforcement back in 1980. The clothing was submitted to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, and they told us that they did have DNA. The DNA located on Kelly's pants and underwear was from seminal fluid. So this was a huge break in the case. This is incredible. I think for the first time in my life, I felt like there's a ray of hope here. In looking at the maps, you could see where there were clearly three major roads that were used to dump the bodies and to dump the evidence. And so a triangle was established. At one point is where the majority of the evidence was found. At another point is the concrete house. And at the third corner would be the location where Tim and Kelly's bodies were found. So this was something somebody used to throw us off the track, or this person lives or is very familiar with this area. Though he cannot know for sure, Garcia says his gut tells him someone local is responsible. Media is a valuable tool for law enforcement to use. They have a huge audience, and they can get people to say something they normally wouldn't say, or maybe get people to feel that what they thought wasn't important is important. It had been a couple months since the news story ran, and one evening I received a phone call. It was a female who identifies herself as April. She explains to me that their family were basically drifters, that they lived in a lot of locations. In the summer of 1980, they lived in the Concord area within that triangle. She said, I think my dad could be responsible for Tim and Kelly. I think he killed them. April believes her father may be involved in the disappearance and killing of Tim and Kelly. And she said his name is Edward Wayne Edwards. She tells me about a book that he had written that she said would explain more about her, her father. We'll 
the real Ed Edwards, please stand up. Back in the early 70s, Edwards appears on numerous talk shows and game shows with this book about his life as a master criminal. In the late 60s, Edwards was on the FBI 10 Most Wanted list. He was a suspect in a double homicide in Portland, Oregon. They couldn't prove that he did it, but upon checking the criminal history of Edward Wayne Edwards, I see that he has been in prison. He has been convicted of numerous crimes to include robbery, uh, vehicle theft, fraud, arson. He's done a lot of, of things. And he goes on the circuit talking to people about what a horrible person he had been, but what a great person he had become. I met a man uh, who was a guard at the uh, penitentiary, and he's the one that uh, helped me to rehabilitate. As I read the book, what was so interesting was he exhibited all of the classic signs of the stereotypical signs of a serial killer. He was a bedwetter. He had an affinity for starting fires. He was extremely controlling. For some serial killers, the need to put on a normal face to interact with members of society and have access to victims is very important. In fact, if they looked unusual or weird or bizarre, they might not get to approach victims in the way that they need to. My life has certainly been anything but good. Dangerous, yes. Honest, no. In addition to that, Edward's daughter, April, had told me her dad was in the military, that he had been dishonorably discharged from the military. So Ed Edwards knows how to tie these knots. And his house is, is smack dab in the middle of where Kelly and Tim were last seen alive and where their bodies were ultimately located. This drifter, stranger, who floated around who wasn't really from Wisconsin. He wasn't from Jefferson County. We obviously have a new prime suspect. I start going back through the reports and seeing if there's a mention of Edward Wayne Edwards. And I had him on my suspect list. Edwards was interviewed in early September of 1980 he really didn't have a lot of information to offer. He did not know anything about Tim or Kelly's disappearance. The one thing that stuck out to me was that he had a broken nose. He said it was a deer hunting incident that caused the rifle to kick back and caused the broken nose that seemed odd to me. Gun deer hunting in Wisconsin is November not in August. Once I found out where Edwards had lived, I talked to the landlord that took care of the house. He said that Edwards lived in that house for a brief time and then moved to another state shortly after the disappearance of Tim and Kelly. They packed up in the middle of the night during the school year. There are advantages to having a drifter-like lifestyle. You're not accountable for your whereabouts at any given time. You don't necessarily have people tracking you and keeping up on your location. For a serial killer, it's actually quite ideal. The landlord also found some rope in the garage. And this rope was of similar characteristics to the rope that was found alongside the road. Edwards had a van. He kept a 357 revolver in the van. This van adds up with the van that was spotted that night. What was especially suspicious in 1980, Edward Wayne Edwards was a handyman at the Concord House. Everything was making sense. Everything was pointing towards Edwards. I think I know what happened to Tim and Kelly.
Edwards was waiting in the parking lot. Kelly fit the profile he was looking for. Tim being a strong farm boy, got a good swing in on Edwards, causing the broken nose. And that's when Tim was stabbed. There's no telling what happened in the van, but we know that Kelly was raped and strangled to death. I need to go to Louisville, Kentucky. I need to talk to Edwards, and I need to get his DNA. If Ed Edwards truly was a psychopath, not having a conscience, not having empathy, not being afraid of punishment would have made it very easy for Edwards to kill again. I was nervous. I realized what kind of person I was dealing with. There was a high probability that Edwards committed these crimes. He is a very, very dangerous person. This was it. I was surprised with his health condition. He was in a wheelchair, on oxygen, very overweight, and not in very good health. Throughout the entire time that we spoke with him, he acted very nonchalant, like it didn't matter that we were there at all. For some serial killers, it is a game. Given Edwards' age, it might have been this was his last opportunity to manipulate law enforcement. When I asked him to provide a sample of his DNA so that we could test it, he said that he had no problem doing that. He thinks he's smarter than us. After 29 years, he's thinking, what DNA are we going to have? How are we going to prove this? Turns out. It's a match. At the time, we take him into custody. We're just waiting on those guys. Let's take the oh. talk to your wife. Edwards is acting as though this is no big deal. Oh, OK, with my wife. Oh. That's just a big concern. <laughs> I'm joking. No, they're not. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I know you are. <laughs> So one of the traits of a psychopath is this superficial charm that they can turn on and off at will in order to do their bidding. I don't hey, wanna... thanks. No problem. They call you Cal, is that what you told Kyle. me? Kyle. Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. Myself and the DCI agent speak with Edwards. I'm willing to make a statement and answer questions. I do not want a lawyer at this time. Do you agree with that? Well, we'll go over them again if you're not comfortable. I mean, everything's, everything's fine. Everything's fine, okay. He waves his Miranda rights, and we explain a number of things showing that he is responsible for this. We're trying to get him to give us his version of events. This is your shot. I mean, this is your show. Oh, I... there, if there's anything you want to get off your chest, I'm, I'm yours. I'm here to listen to you. But unfortunately, this is your only shot. He completely denies ever killing anyone. Remember, you say that you didn't kill him. Okay. No, sir, I've right. never killed All right. anyone. All right. I'm going to ask and you this then. And enough Who did? Me. Who did it? Throughout the eight plus hours of interviewing with Edwards, he remained calm the entire time. And he frequently would try to change topics. I use two shots of insulin a day. Uh, he would talk about anything he could to stay away from talking about Tim and Kelly. My mind is just a muddle. His manipulating law enforcement in the interrogations is very consistent with who Ed Edwards is and had been his entire life. He lied, he manipulated, he conned. You can continue no, this. No, I, I, I know, I know. I, I think but, this is just a game for you. And He's right, your DNA was there, and that's the bottom line. Yeah, so you can explain, no, you can wait, explain wait, 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 you're not in charge. You talk to us. He's 
lying to us, trying to beat us, thinking he's smarter than us. So I decided to feed into his ego. And I had his book with me. But if you wouldn't mind signing the book, would you mind doing that for me? Yeah, oh, money. Well, how much I'm, a, much I'm a police officer. I don't have any money. <laughs> and he did enjoy that. I'm going to sign this as Wayne, OK? Sure. During the final hour or two of the interview, we asked him if he could explain the seminal fluid DNA being on Kelly's clothes. So then he comes up with the most unbelievable story. All right, I had sex with her. You had sex with the young lady who died? Yes. OK, that explains a lot. Consensual? With me? Yes. Oh, yes. Not, not forcible, not. Oh, no, 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 no. It was consensual. Tim and Kelly were joined at the hip. Kelly Drew's not going to go off and, and willingly have sex with Ed Edwards in a cornfield. But Edwards, the defense attorney, could have said it was consensual sex. We as prosecutors have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this is the person. And the DNA was really good. But from a prosecutor's standpoint, is that strong enough? After conducting the interview of Edwards, which was digitally recorded, I went back to see if maybe there was something he said that I didn't pick up on, or maybe there were certain movements he made to tell me when he was lying. Her boyfriend. As I'm watching the video, something struck me. There was a comment that he made when nobody was speaking with him, and it was myself and Detective Sergeant Brian Nunn in the room. He said something sort of under his breath. We probably rewound it, you know, a thousand times, trying to make sure uh, that we heard what we heard. I can remember exactly where I was when I when I heard that recording. He thought it was under his breath, or maybe it was subconsciously that he said it. But he clearly wasn't saying it out loud. It was quietly said. And after listening to it repeatedly and having many others listen to it repeatedly, everyone agreed that what he said is, Damn, I, I killed her. Damn it, I killed her. Damn, I, I killed her. To hear him say, damn it, I killed her. It's a goosebump moment. Rarely do you have someone who's committed a double homicide actually admit what they did, and that took away any possibility that he would not be found guilty. We got him. We got him. We got our guy. And ultimately, he pleads guilty to killing Tim and Kelly. We don't know why he confessed. He had been playing the game of cat and mouse for many years. But I was happy to see that the two families did get closure. It was over, you know, that feeling of it's over. Ed Edwards returns to Wisconsin to face justice for the murders of Tim Hack and Kelly Drew. But as his health fails, he reveals a 33-year secret to the cold case detectives. While Edwards is in the infirmary in Wisconsin, he begins sending letters to a detective in Ohio regarding two other young people that he had murdered, Billy Lavaco and Judith Straub. His goal is to return to Ohio and get the death penalty for killing them. Edwards wants to maintain control over his life, over his trajectory. And he will say anything and do anything when the opportunity presents itself to maintain that control. He's again trying to manipulate the system and control you know, his future. 
but he doesn't know that there was a chunk of time that went over the Lavaco and Straub homicides where the death penalty um, did not apply. So once he realizes that, Edwards confesses to killing uh, his foster son, Danny. I felt bad, but uh, apparently not bad enough that I kept from doing it. And that's the case that is death penalty eligible. We don't generally in, in prosecution circles, you know, give defendants what they want, but it's going to solve five homicides now. There are people working in law enforcement who do believe that Edwards committed many more murders than he confessed to. Edwards was an over-the-road truck driver that traveled to California in the late 60s. Because of this, some people believe Edward Wayne Edwards is the Zodiac Killer. Zodiac Killer was a serial killer who operated in Northern California in 1968 and 1969. Some of the links include the fact that Edwards was a drifter and he could have been in California at this time, the fact that Edwards killed couples and that the Zodiac Killer also killed couples. Symbols that are used to sign off on the Zodiac letters consist of 13 symbols. Edward Edwards is 13 letters, and his birth name of Charles Murray is 13 letters as well. The more trouble you get into, the bigger you are. This is why I was out there committing the crime, was for the recognition. It definitely was the highlight of my career to get somebody like that, um, especially for the families, to get this done and to put a bad, bad person behind bars. Ed Edwards was held accountable for what he did, and he had to admit what he had done, and I think that you know, really brings me some, some peace. Tim and Kelly's death made us realize that there are terrible things in the world and you have to appreciate every day and what we have. I think Tim was a son that a lot of fathers would have liked to have. And we'll never know what may have been, but we don't want Tim and Kelly forgotten. Sophia went to her grave knowing a lot about a lot of people. Two people, the same family, the same year, too much there to be coincidence. We live in fear. We had two family members missing. Who was going to be next? We started to locate the first bone. You just got a cold feeling. Could this be the unknown crime scene we've been looking for all these years? When an investigation runs out of leads, it becomes a cold case. Years pass, and hope fades. But for the families of the victims, these cases are never cold. The truth takes time. In the deep woods of Appalachia, nothing is what it seems. When her sister disappears, Reba is desperate for answers. Meanwhile, a detective spends decades determined to uncover the one thing he knows might close the case, the crime scene. When Zelfia was born, I was just so excited because she was born a day after my birthday. I was 10 years old. I made her bottles. I changed her diapers. She was just like my real-life baby doll. 
She loved writing poems, and she loved unicorns. She collected them. She could get down to, like, a child's level, always, you know, wanting to joke and play and just have fun. Uh, everybody's kids loved her so much. She was my favorite aunt. I loved her with all my heart. I really think I loved her more than I loved my parents at times. I myself had an amazing bond with her, but it was nothing like Jeremiah's. Jeremiah was Zelfia's nephew. He was a very quiet person. He hardly ever would talk much to anybody. They were sort of like brother and sister because they were so close to each other. Jeremiah was raised in some pretty rough circumstances. His father, Eddie, was gone quite a bit, and I think it was a neglectful relationship. There was one time Zelfia and Jeremiah witnessed something really bad. They were parked at Eddie's girlfriend's house. Eddie comes and tells them to leave. Then, right after they leave, he burns the house down. Zelfia and Jeremiah, they didn't go to no authorities or nothing like that. They just kept it quiet, told a few family members, and that was it. My brother had been coming back to Marion, and he seen Jeremiah's truck on the side of the interstate. Jeremiah was living with his friends at the time. The boys that he was staying with said that he left and went to his daddy's. And that was the last time he was ever seen. Jeremiah was missing, but there was no real evidence of a crime. There was not a lot of concern on the part of the investigators at the time. They had heard rumors that Jeremiah had probably gotten in a truck with a truck driver and gone somewhere to Texas. They had hoped he was somewhere where he wanted to be on a beach in Mexico, uh, you know, enjoying the sunshine. Zelfia knows he did not leave town. Zelfia had come to my house, and she was just really upset. She said Jeremiah would not have left without telling her. And she goes, I want to tell you about a dream that I had last night. She dreamed that Jeremiah's own daddy, Eddie Pittman, had killed Jeremiah. And had buried him. And put lime on him. It made my heart beat so fast. And she told me she was going to confront him. And I begged her to not confront him because I was scared for her life. She wasn't going to stop till she found out what happened to Jeremiah. She was not going to stop. Zelfia was a waitress. 
she worked at the truck stop, which was just a little ways down the road from her house. Delphia would walk to work and back home sometimes, you know, if somebody didn't give her a ride. One day, Zelfia didn't come home after work. I filed a missing persons report. The Sheriff's Department didn't believe us. Law enforcement at the time felt that she's not missing, she's just gone because she wanted to be gone. Zelfia was, was pretty much a free spirit. She liked to have a good time. It wasn't that unusual for her to decide that she was going to be gone for two or three days. We had two family members missing. They was making every excuse in the world they could to keep from looking for Jeremiah and Selfia. Everybody in that sheriff's office was awful. You could walk in and they looked at you like you was trash. Like, you know, we wasn't worthy. One time, they told me to go do my own investigation to get rid of me. I go to the truck stop and I start asking questions. Nobody wanted to talk to me about it. I tried everything that I could. I wanted to know what happened. I wanted it for her. I wanted it for us, my family. There were some hunters out in a remote area of our county around Lake James. Who ran across the remains. There were some fragments of hair and some tissue adhering to some of the bones, but the remains were skeletonized almost completely. There wasn't any type of burial or real concealment. appeared like that the body was just left on top of the ground and there had been some animal activity. There was also a sheet and a towel and some clothing that was identified as Zephyr. I noted it was her. I could feel it before they even confirmed that it was her. She had suffered severe trauma to the head. Her skull was almost crushed completely. Her remains had been dumped there. There was another crime scene somewhere. They just did not know where that was. Since Elphia's remains were found, then they have to take it serious. They have to investigate. All of a sudden, law enforcement says, it's time to pursue this thing. Now, we have a murder. Marion is a rural community in um, Appalachian foothills. The mountains have their own kind of culture with our share of problems as well. I took an interest in the Lowry case early on. I was working in a small town in a neighboring county. 
I heard that there had been a body found. The first day I came to work, there was a case file left on a desk of one of the investigators, and that was Zilfia's case file. I've always been one that likes a challenge, and so I approached the detective captain and asked him, do you mind if I pick up that file and take a look at it? He looked at me and he said, get it, take it, solve it. The scene where Zilfia's remains were recovered is certainly one crime scene that we had. If we could locate that second crime scene, that's probably where we're going to find our murderer. At the same time I was going through that file, I was trying to digest the Jeremiah Pittman file. We had two people in the same family in the same year go missing. One of them turns up dead, one of them still missing. These cases either have to be related or it is a real coincidence. When you're taking on a case, you have to pick up the ball from where it is. It's kind of like drinking from a fire hose because there's so much information and it's coming at you like crazy. First, we needed to go back and talk to people at the last place Zilfio was seen, the truck stop. One of the individuals who discussed last seeing Zilfia said that she got in the car with someone, but nobody knew who he was or where they were going. We needed to try to get some more information. I visited the McDowell County Jail. Jails can become a somewhat of a rumor mill. There were people who, for one reason or another, wanted to interject themselves into this case. One individual talked about being with some guys when they had taken a blonde-haired girl wrapped up in a sleeping bag, carried her out in the woods, and left her there. Another guy claimed that he had been asked by a drug dealer to take this girl away because she had been killed. I heard 11 or 12 different versions of what happened to Zelfia. It was kind of a, a moving target, so to speak. I arranged a sit down with several of the family members to see what information they might be able to give. We were so desperate to try to find out something. I was just happy that there was someone to listen and, and try to help. We had two family members missing, Zelfia and Jeremiah. To me, all signs pointed to one person, Jeremiah's daddy, Eddie Pittman. I told Detective Green about Zelfia's dream. Zelfia just knowed that that dream was telling her Eddie had killed Jeremiah. If he killed Jeremiah, he could kill her too. Reba described a dream. From an investigator's standpoint, we have to deal in terms of evidence that we have and and, and dreams or visions um, are not evidence. So I said, OK. I really thought that Eddie did it. And I'll tell you why. Zelfia and Jeremiah witnessed Eddie burning the house down for his girlfriend, Rosemary, so she can get insurance money. If Eddie burned Rosemary's house and they had witnessed that, that could be a possible motive for murder. We felt like we had enough information to talk to Eddie. Ed was in denial of having anything to do with Jeremiah's disappearance. And he was in total denial about Zelfia, doesn't know anything about her murder. We've got to do something with this lead here. We've got to be able to develop it further or eliminate it. 
And so we just keep working at it over the next several months. One day, the chief deputy came back to my office and he looked at me and he said, Rosemary Gehrings in the lobby wants to talk to you. And I looked at him, I said, what about? And he said, I don't know. She was led back to my office and came in and she had a concerned look on her face. And I'm like, Rosemary, how can I help you today? And she said, well, I, I wanted to come see you. I, I think Eddie's going to kill me. Why do you think Eddie would want to kill you? She said, because of what I could say. When Rosemary walked in my office that day, the last thing I thought I'd be doing would be driving her around while she's pointing where to go. She had said, I think Eddie Pittman is going to kill me because of what I know. We ride down to this real remote area. All of a sudden, she stops. She walks over to a ditch, points in the ditch, and she says, it's right there. Start digging. We spent quite a bit of time digging. We weren't finding anything. She walked over to the ditch. She said, you're in the right place, but you're not deep enough. We continued to dig, and we started to locate the first bone exactly where she pinpointed is where Jeremiah's remains were, were found. Your heart's jumping through your chest. And so she began to tell the story of witnessing a confrontation between Ed and Jeremiah, where Jeremiah ended up dead. Eddie picked up a hammer so he could finish Jeremiah off. They had taken Jeremiah's truck and abandoned it out on the interstate. Rosemary had gone with him to dispose of the body. Part of what they did in, in disposing of him was to pour the lime in the, in the hole. Unselfiest nightmare came true. Her dream was gift to her for a reason. Zelfia knew where Jeremiah was. She knew exactly where he was. Whoa, here, this is not just some abstract dream. This is real blunt force injury to the head. It was just like Zilphia's murder. Ed Pittman, for heaven's sakes, killed his own son, killed him the same way Zilphia was killed, in the same county, during the same year. There's too much there to be coincidence. Was it actually a dream? We don't know, but she knew what happened to Jeremiah. We went to Ed's house. A number of us went out there, not knowing what Eddie might be capable of. He advised Eddie that we had a warrant for his arrest and that he was under arrest for murder. And I'll never forget the reaction Eddie gave me. He said, whose murder? 
Now we're really convinced Eddie could have killed Zelfia. I said, let me ask you a question. What happened to Zelfia? He hadn't seen her, and he didn't know anything about her. Eddie don't confess to nothing. We haven't found any evidence to connect Ed to Zelfia. Nothing solid. We've got her body. That's all we have. He was charged with Jeremiah's murder. He pled guilty, and uh, there was a plea agreement to manslaughter. I really thought that Eddie did it, that he got rid of Zelfia because of her suspicions of him. I think Eddie Pittman got away with my sister's murder. I think the, the family thought that Eddie could have killed Zelfia, but we're not finding anything. Sure, there's a lot of speculation, some suspicious circumstances, but nothing you can really hang your hat on. I started to think that Eddie Pittman had nothing to do with this. The longer a case goes, the less likely they are to be solved. You know that statistically. With Zelfia, you don't have suspects. You don't have a direction to go. You don't have really any indication of what happened. The case was cold, very cold. All those years, not knowing, not hearing nothing. I didn't know who killed her, but I knew somebody in that town knew something. The 10 year anniversary of Zilfia's murder. Detective Green gets a story to run in the local paper. He hopes the story might spark a confession. I uh, was trying to pull at some heartstrings there. Emotions can be a strong motivator for somebody to talk. We were approached by a prisoner in jail. His name was Ricky. He gives us a name, Ronald. Ricky thinks that Ronald may have been involved in Zilfia's death. Several years ago, Ronald had shown up in a van with a fairly significant blood stain shortly after Zilfia's disappearance. We are cautiously optimistic that this may be the break we've been looking for. And so we begin trying to find that van. We found the van. We ultimately ended up finding it in a junkyard. It had been there for a long time. There were some stains in that van that appeared like they could be blood stains. There's a chemical called phenolphthalein, which is a test for the presence of blood. And when phenolphthalein reacts with blood, it turns a bright pink color. They were not blood stains. And so Ronald's van was not the crime scene. But Zilfia's family came to us with a suggestion that we might want to talk with Ronald. Ronald was friends with my son. One day, Ronald had told my son that he knows what happened to my sister. I remember sitting down with Ronald, and pretty much one of the first things that Ronald comes with was, I can tell you what happened to Zilfia. Ronald said that at the time that Sylvia disappeared, there were two guys who lived in a mobile home near a friend of Ronald's. 
Ronald said that his friends had gone over there one night to ask him to turn some music down and that they was real suspicious the way they'd answered the door and wouldn't let anybody in. And then later that night, Ronald's friends actually saw two guys moving something that looked like a rolled up carpet or something to that nature. Ronald said that maybe he's hauling her body away. The first reaction is, could this be real? This story that Ronald was telling us could have just been a smoke screen to throw us in another direction. Yet at the same time, he had given a pretty good description of where that trailer was. We made a decision to try to find that trailer. And, you know, it's been 11 or 12 years. Is the trailer even still there? Well, Dudley went out to the area that Ronald had described I found the landlady. She walked over, pointed out the trailer. Here it is. It was an abandoned old single wide trailer. And she confirmed that, uh, yeah, back around 1993, there was a guy that had lived at that uh, mobile home. And she gave us the last name of Whited, Robin Whited. At that point, I got a cold feeling. Animals had been in the trailer. Just the sheer um, uh, cold feeling that I got. Strange, very strange. I don't know. Uh, I almost wondered. It, it almost had that feeling about it. I don't know. Could this really be where Zelfa was murdered? Could this be the unknown crime scene we've been looking for all these years? weren't sure whether this was our crime scene, but we had a name. This guy, Robin, might be able to give us some answers. The landlord told us that Robin had moved back to what she thought was Richland's Virginia area. We went to Virginia, seeing if we could locate this Robin and have a conversation with him. I was able to locate where Robin was working at a, uh, a car dealership. He was very polite and acknowledged almost right away that, yeah, they had partied with some girl. And she had a strange name. I mentioned the name Zelfia. And he said, yeah, that sounds right. Showed him a picture of Zelfia. And he acknowledged that, yeah, that's the girl that he had partied with. He remembers this blonde-haired girl coming over to party one night. That he had had sex with her. But the next morning, she was gone. He did not know when she left exactly. And he had no knowledge or clue that she had met with any kind of foul play. If he'd said, I don't know what you're talking about, don't know this girl, never saw her before, he basically would have shut us down again, and we would have come back empty-handed. But now we have direct information that places Zilfia at that trailer. And now we're walking away with a suspect. We really didn't have any physical evidence against Robin. 
But because of what Robin had said, we're even more convinced that the trailer is where Zelfa was murdered. We knew Zelfia had died from extensive blunt force trauma. The medical examiner had told us we likely had a bloody crime scene. So we had hoped, best case scenario, we might be able to find some blood, even after all these years. It had been somewhat open to the elements, so we knew we were up against some pretty staggering odds. It was the ultimate Hail Mary pass. Myself and the other detectives were taking swabs of any place and every place that blood spatter might still be. Not likely, but you always have that hope. After several hours, every one of us was just drenched with sweat, but we weren't finding anything. At this point, he'd probably done 150 swabs. Sometimes you see something that uh, you didn't see before. I knew that flies are naturally attracted to blood, and flies constantly excrete and regurgitate. Whatever they get into, they're leaving traces of that somewhere. I was looking up at, at the, uh, the bathroom ceiling and saw these dozen or so little brown specks. I'm thinking it might be fly speck. So I climbed up on the edge of the tub and just swabbed the specks and handed those down for analysis. All of a sudden, one of those swabs, it lights up brilliant pink. Yes, this is what we've been looking for. I mean, there were some high fives went up. Happy as we were, that still didn't say whether this was Zilfia's blood. We did not have anything to compare a sample with because in 1994, when Zilfa's remains were found, DNA wasn't as uh, prevalent a science. And so there was no sample of her DNA that was preserved. Where do we go from here? I knew we had to do it in order to get her DNA. When you reach out to a family and say, we're headed down this road as an investigator, that's not something you take lightly. I told them to do what they needed to do. And they wanted to know if I wanted to be there when she was exhumed. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't rebury her. It's something that needs to be done with dignity and respect. And yet, at the same time, you're on a search for evidence. Since it was just bones, they put all of her bones in a little baby casket. And that's how we buried her. I never will forget the look on my son's face when I went home that day and I, I went home to change clothes. He asked me why I got so dirty <laughs> and, uh, you know, exp explained to him, uh, I, he knows what daddy does for a living, and, but yet didn't necessarily think about his uh, dad going digging up a grave, you know. That's one of those things that stay with you. But it was a pretty good day when that lab report came back. I was crying. I was saying, oh my God, the DNA matched in that trailer. That's when you know you're on the right road. There's no doubt there anymore. We're going to get these guys. We're going to get them. Detective Shook and Detective Green came into the district attorney's office. And what they told me was that they had a suspect, Robin White. And now I've got a piece of physical evidence I could take to the jury. 
This is a circumstantial case. We're building it brick by brick by brick by brick. Robin, I'm just going to ask you about the death of Zelfia Lowry. I came in from work that evening. Bobby had his girl's phone number. And sitting on the car here at the open party. Who do you say Bobby? Uh, Bobby Taylor? Yes. Okay. Robin was able to give us a name, and that was Bobby Taylor. Bobby has an extensive criminal record with some violent offenses on his rap sheet. Robin was having sex with Zilpha. Bobby wanted his turn. But Zilpha doesn't want any part of Bobby Taylor. Bobby Taylor becomes angry with Zilpha then slammed Zilpha's head into the floor several times. Robin said that he had personally witnessed Bobby beat her to death. We've got an eyewitness to a murder. Robin was charged as an accessory. We find out where Bobby is. Bobby's in federal prison. Bobby remembered this blonde-haired girl had come over to his trailer and partied one night. But his story was that when he had last seen her, she was alive and well. So we started confronting him with some of the things that Robin said. And Bobby pretty well shut down. And I said, Bobby, I've been doing this for 25 years. And he looked at me and he said, what you don't understand is, I've been doing this for 25 years. And he was sitting in prison at the time. He was no stranger to trouble. This was something that Bobby was kind of accustomed to. Before the trial of Robert Taylor, Robin comes down for an interview and brings with him a videotape. This is the videotape Robin White had made along about the time of Zelfia's disappearance. As the trial progresses, we play this videotape for the jury. It's the crime scene as it was 13 years ago. At one point, he zeroed in on the bathroom where Zilpha died. I argued to the jury that Robin knows what happened, that he has a guilty conscience of it, that he did what Bobby Taylor told him to do because he was scared of Bobby Taylor, that his guilty conscience made him this videotape. The jury has reached a verdict. Then the judge has Bobby Taylor stand up. When he got up, he looked and stared. Each one of the family members that was sitting on the seats and smiled this smirky smile at us. He had the devil in his eyes. I seen the devils in his eyes. When we were able to bring this case together, I felt like it was the answer to a lot of prayers. Mine too. Green and the McDowell County Sheriff's Department finally deliver justice as Bobby Taylor is imprisoned for the murder of Zelfia. After 15 years, Zelfia's family finally has the truth and hopefully some comfort.
This is where she died, right here. I loved Zelfia more than anybody in this world. The pain's still there. I still feel it. I'd like to see it just demolished. Get rid of the evilness. I have dreams of her. She looks the same in my dreams as she did when she was 24 years old. I really do think that dreams are given to us sometimes for reasons. In my dreams, Selfie is always smiling, and I'm just happy. Now she can rest in peace. I remember meeting Janelle. She was so excited and bubbly that it was infectious. You couldn't help but smile. And when she came to my house, it was like the sun came in. And when she was taken, the sun left for a while. When somebody you love is killed and there's no justice, there's no conviction. I don't want to say I was walking in a dream because it was more like walking in a nightmare. As the years went on, I started doubting whether she would ever have justice. And now as I speak about it, it's like it happened yesterday. I could feel it. I still don't believe it. It's Monday morning, the start of another week at Red Bank Middle School. Teacher Janelle Melton has something special planned for her fifth graders, a guest speaker of sorts. The students take their seats, but Janelle doesn't show up. School had been in session for a couple weeks, and President Obama had did a speech about education. She was going to bring her class to my class, and we were going to play the speech inside the classroom. Mrs. Melton wanted to show us that we can be a part of history, and she actually attended the inauguration for Barack Obama. The time has come to reaffirm our enduring spirit, the God-given promise that all are equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. She actually had a picture that she shared with us, and it was like pretty much her standing in the crowd. You could see the sense of wonder and pride on her face and the seriousness. Oh, she was going to that inauguration. If she had to walk, she was going, you hear me? Janelle taught social studies, had a passion for history and also knew how to teach it to students to get them interested in it. She would learn all the quirky facts about the different people that she was teaching. And her enthusiasm about history, it transferred to the students. They loved it. She was adamant, I'm going to be the teacher of the year. She was writing lesson plans in August. She was talking and thinking in terms of how she was going to implement her lessons. It was inspiring. I knew Janelle in Trenton when we were young. Her elementary school was across the street from my house. And I used to talk little junk to her and, you know, flirt with her a little bit, things of that nature. Once I graduated from college, and I started working as a, a counselor for school based youth service. And she was also a teacher, and I saw her. I was like, wow, she's looking good. So, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm fresh out of college. I'm a bachelor. So I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm living a life. Like, I'm like, what, what's up with her? 
Michael gets serious about Chanel and leaves his bachelor life behind. She was the one, and I felt like I should put a ring on her hand. Man, Janelle got married in Jamaica August 28th, uh, 2003. We had a ceremony in Jamaica at Sandals in Ocho Rios, and we had about 30 people. It was beautiful, man. I was still young then, though. I was like 27, 28. She was one year younger than me, so she had to be about 26. I was excited and stuff, like I'm really married. Michael and Janelle are a married couple and co-workers at Red Bank Middle School. Miss Mountain, she was always very happy, a happy-go-lucky woman, while Mr. Mountain, he was very chill. He was very laid back, very well put together. They were definitely like yin and yang. A happy home life and rewarding careers. It appears Janelle and Michael have a solid foundation. But three years after their wedding, that foundation starts to crack. She cared about me tremendously. It was just like I had never met nobody that was so into me like that. Whatever I needed, she was right there. But the way I was raised later on, it kind of made me feel uncomfortable because I wasn't used to that much affection. I used to go out and spend time away. And I had just started my basketball company. So it was more of me being immature and not really being able to handle that kind of love and the responsibility of being a husband. That's why I filed for divorce. Most of the people probably thought that she wanted to divorce me, but she wouldn't have never left me. She told me that. Once the relationship had got to a certain point, she had felt comfortable with she had her own space. You know what I'm saying? And, and I respected that. So we still saw each other all the time, and we talked on the phone every day. F the school day slips away, and there's still no sign of Janelle. The school secretary asks Michael to check on the missing teacher at her home in Neptune City, about 20 minutes away. I pull up at the house, and I see the car in front of the house. So I feel kind of relieved, because I know she's at least home. So I'm thinking I'm just going to bang on this door, yell out her name, tell her to get up, and tell her to go to work. I yelled out her name. It was no answer. And then I tried the doorknob, and the door was open. And I went in, and I was still yelling out her name, yelling out her name. And I made the quick left to go to the room. And then when I walked in the room, that's when I saw her on the floor. When I found her, she had her nightgown on, and I saw a little bit of blood at the top of the nightgown, and her face looked like it had makeup on it. So I immediately thought that she fell when she was doing her makeup. And then that's when I picked up the phone, and I called 911, and I told them to um, hurry up and come over. And I was asking her, like, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? I remember saying that, because I thought that since we were separated, she couldn't handle it, and she had did something to herself. Paramedics arrive within minutes of Michael's call. When they came, the first person went up to her and he was like, miss, 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 ma'am, ma'am. He felt her neck, and then that's when he told me she was dead. And then that's when I just like dropped them on my knees. I started crying. Then he said, you got to get out of here. I guess because it's a crime scene now. It was like surreal, like I was living a movie. I couldn't believe it. I just started screaming. A shell shop, Michael Melton, calls Red Bank Middle School and breaks the horrible news to Janelle's coworkers. I talked to the secretary, and I'm like crying hysterically and stuff. Then I told him, like, the guy says he's dead. We drove to her apartment, and I saw the yellow tape. <laughs> And I said, oh, my God. I started screaming, oh, my God. I said, somebody hurt her. This is a crime scene. Seven investigation at it looks like a scene from a movie or maybe like a first 48 episode. The scene at Janelle's apartment is gruesome enough to shock even the most experienced homicide detectives. It was evident to the detectives involved that Jonelle Melton was the victim of a brutal beating, and she was tortured. I 
worked as the supervising lieutenant in charge of the forensic unit. I received a call from the local departments that they had come in contact with a deceased woman in an apartment complex. Bright and Arms apartment is a garden style apartment. They're two story buildings. Janelle Melton's apartment was located on the first floor and it was accessible from a common walkway. With just a quick look around the crime scene, detectives know they're searching for at least two killers. Because of the how physical the crime scene was, how brutal it was, we believed it was a male more than one. The kitchen dinette area had a window, which I noticed immediately as a point of forced entry. Directly under that window, on one of the chairs, was a footwear impression where someone came through the window and stepped on that chair. We noticed that the kitchen area was ransacked. The kitchen cabinets were open. The closets were, uh, went through. They had gone through cereal boxes. Somebody was looking for something. Detectives believe that Chanel was murdered in her bedroom during the late night hours of September 13th. It was evident to the detectives involved that Jonelle Melton was the victim of a brutal beating, and she was tortured. And in our opinion, these injuries were caused over time until her death in an attempt to get either information or something from her. Ultimately, without leaving witnesses, they shot her through the head and killed her. Crime scene techs scour the apartment and find items that could be telltale clues. Throughout the house, we noticed that there were no candles. We know that the victim was not a smoker. There were no cigarettes. There were no ashtrays. But at the base of that window, we located a pink-colored lighter. And the lighter itself seemed to be out of place. There was that piece of fray-colored duct tape. It appeared that it was used in a manner that could potentially have been a binding. And it had obvious signs of blood staining on it. And located near Jonelle Melton's body were used latex gloves. They were collected for evidence and submitted to the laboratory for examination. While evidence is collected inside, detectives move outside to talk to a distraught Michael Melton. Chanel's soon-to-be ex-husband and close friend. They was like, you're going to have to answer the same questions a lot today, so you're going to have to be prepared for that. So I was like, OK. Michael was the soon-to-be ex-husband. He was the first one to discover her body. He was close with her. So I'm sure the detectives wanted to get a feel for what he was thinking about her at the time. After almost an hour of waiting, detectives move in and pepper him with questions. At first, the detectives started out like they was trying to get information to ask me about our relationship. And then when I started answering the questions and telling them, then they started getting a little, like, a little invasive. I don't want to offend you or anything, and I know this is a little personal, but like, were you guys still sexually involved Sometimes. and stuff like that? Sometimes, yeah. But I still loved it, but I just knew that once we got into the marriage thing, mm -hmm. it it wasn't going to be, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When they asked me about the house, and they told me how ramshacked it was, I couldn't remember none of that. I think once I saw her, everything else just shut down. Even if they was trying to come off of me like crazy and stuff, I just still was answering their questions because I knew I didn't do nothing. Michael says he was visiting a friend the night of Janelle's murder. Then later that night, he went to his girlfriend's house. It's like a little toothbrush. Michael agrees to give a DNA sample and then leaves police headquarters to be with grieving family and friends. Meanwhile, detectives make their next moves. They run down Michael's alibi and search Janelle's apartment complex. There were uh, forensics detectives outside in dumpsters, behind bushes, just trying to find any type of uh, evidence they could. When detectives talk with Michael's girlfriend, she verifies his alibi, and his phone records place him nowhere near Janelle's apartment the night she was killed. Detectives are confident that he had nothing to do with Janelle's death. 
there was no reason for Michael to ever be involved in anything like this. He, ha he still had a wonderful relationship with Janello. Although they were ex-spouses, they didn't act like ex-spouses. They had a really nice personal and working relationship. Investigators might have moved on from Michael, but the media hasn't. Now, all of this time, I'm thinking that I'm being truthful and helping them, like telling them everything they needed to know. And then two days later, when a newspaper article came out, that's when I knew that something was wrong. It said she was found. It didn't say who found her. And in the last paragraph, it said she was estranged from her husband. And when I saw the word estranged, I said, whoa. Then it said their divorce was supposed to be final October 6th. And this was like September 16th. So now I'm like, oh my god. They trying to say I killed her. Chanel's friends, family, and colleagues gather to say their final goodbyes. They actually shut school down for the funeral. When we went in, that's, that's when it all became real for me. Like, I know I got up and I spoke on the stage. I can't tell you everything I said. I don't want to say I was walking in a dream because it was more like walking in a nightmare. I'm sitting in the front, look down the aisle, and the three detectives is walking down the aisle. Terror just went through me. I was scared. They just walked past and shook my hand and gave my condolences. But then they was in the lobby area talking to her different friends, asking them different stuff and this and that. And I just felt that that was so disrespectful. After the funeral, Michael takes steps to defend himself. Then one of my friends, he was an attorney, and he said that they're going to try to pin this on you. I'm going to represent you pro bono. Don't say nothing to no nobody. Don't talk to them no more or anything. I can understand why Michael Melton had an attorney, because the way he was treated in the beginning as a suspect. All eyes is on me. So 100%, I had to stop grieving and self-preservation. Everybody turned against me. When I get back to work, it's a memo on my desk. And the memo says you are not allowed to go into any schools and you can't have no contact with kids. Then I lost it. I just was like, why y'all treat me like a criminal? I didn't do anything. Like, why y'all doing this to me? With his attorney in tow, Michael meets with school officials to discuss his employment. He agrees to take a desk job while the investigation continues. Now, the school is right behind the Board of Education. So I'm seeing these kids, but I can't go into the school and I can't have no contact with them. Two months after Janelle's murder, DNA tests done on duct tape found that the crime scene are in. The test results have investigators right back where they started. The evidence came back. The duct tape found in the hallway came back to Mike Melton. Monmouth County detectives have recovered DNA from a piece of duct tape found in Janelle Melton's apartment. This tiny piece of evidence is now at the center of the investigation. The New Jersey State Police Laboratory was able to determine that there were two contributors of DNA-able material on that item. Jonelle Melton, because of the blood on the item, and Michael Melton, Jonelle's husband. Investigators believe the duct tape they found in the hallway was used to bind Janelle to a chair before the attack. Today I found Janelle, my sneaker, got caught on the duct tape. So then when I pulled the duct tape off of my shoe, that's how my DNA got found on the duct tape. He was checking to see if she was still alive, so of course his fingerprints and DNA are going to be on the duct tape. I mean, obviously he cared for her, so anybody going into a scene like that would want to see if that person was alive. Forensic tests on the crime evidence are murky. There's no clear-cut answer on the boot print, and Tex can't lift a usable fingerprint from the latex gloves. In the case of the cigarette lighter, DNA-able evidence was recovered, but they were unable to identify who the major contributor was on that item. As a result, 
I requested that we transport that evidence to the New York City Medical Examiner's Office for additional DNA analysis. They had great advances in DNA analysis, and we were able to, on occasion, either exclude or include a potential donor. While they wait for DNA results on the lighter, which could take months or even years, detectives take a second look at some of the tips they'd received early on. Well, back in 2009, Brighton Arms was generally safe, so everyone was really shocked, especially the, the residents who, who have lived there for years. In one instance, one of the neighbors thought he heard a loud noise. They don't call the police. Um, the lady down the apartment to from Janelle, their dogs are awoken. She sees somebody in the back of that apartment complex. She doesn't call the police. The thought of knowing that there were individuals that actually knew or had some sort of idea of what had happened, it made me question, like, how do you know these things but hold on to them? I was actually angered at the fact that no one was caught or no one witnessed anything or, you know, no one came forward. And for us not to have any answers, I was, there were so many emotions going through me. The case drags on without an arrest, leaving Michael Melton in limbo. He lives his life under a dark cloud of suspicion. Everybody turned against me. Her family turned against me. I knew that they thought I did it. Everywhere you go, you feel like people pointing at you. You feel the chatter. You can't really go to no, like, football games or basketball games. The grocery stores, everywhere I went, I felt shame, even though I didn't do nothing. That was the only time in my life I ever contemplated suicide. And that's when the drinking started. I just went into sin because that's the only thing gave me instant gratification at the time to help me escape. Janelle's family braces for the third holiday season without her. Finally, though, there's a break. Techs find DNA on the lighter. They were able to identify the major contributor to the DNA as Gregory Jean Baptiste. Gregory Jean Baptiste was involved in gangs, specifically the Bloods. This is a picture of the young lady. Uh, her name was uh, Janelle Melton. What? All right. That's what I got for Never seen her. Despite his DNA connection to the lighter, Jean Baptiste claims he had nothing to do with Janelle's murder. We're trying to say that your DNA is in the scene. Never been there, bro. Never been there? Jean Baptiste claims the lighter isn't his. But he offers an explanation as to how his DNA was found there anyway. Drugs, but drugs is my thing. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? I shake a lot of hands when I was done. Yeah. The DNA evidence puts investigators' focus on Jean Baptiste. But DNA alone isn't enough to charge him with Janelle's murder. Without something more, Jean Baptiste will go free. Not only do we have to accept the fact that she was murdered, but I have to also accept the fact that there's no justice. Detectives investigating the murder of middle school teacher Janelle Melton are face to face with Gregory Jean Baptiste, a convicted felon whose DNA was found on a lighter discovered in Janelle's apartment. I, I do you explain that. Though. What is my DNA on? This on evidence that was left at the scene. What's the evidence? The DNA on the lighter would indicate that that person was there because the lighter was found at the scene. Detectives go around in circles with Jean Baptiste, who admits nothing. After 27 minutes in the interrogation room, the suspect has had enough. All right, man, I'm done. You done? Yeah. Detectives believe that Jean Baptiste, possibly along with others, murdered Janelle Melton but they have no way to prove it. Jean Baptiste denies everything, and there are no witnesses. The case of the teacher who never showed up for class goes as cold as the ice in the Red Bank Armory. The 
problem with it was it's not DNA on something that was used to, to harm Janelle. It was found on an otherwise innocent object in another room. You know, it wasn't like a mask or a gun or a knife. It was on a lighter under a window. Neptune City Police are determined to reignite the investigation and catch Janelle's killers. They assigned this cold case to two narcotic squad detectives, Scott Semis and Matthew Quagliato. This case needed a new set of eyes. They needed somebody who was not going to stop until these individuals were brought for justice. We reviewed multiple reports. Um, we reviewed the whole case. Basically, we reopened up everything as it was just a brand new case. Despite the energy new detectives bring to the investigation, fresh leads are hard to come by. While police pour over old reports and evidence, Michael Melton lives life branded as a killer. Everywhere I turned, I couldn't get away from it. I see the, the original detective in the, in the barbershop, and he'd still say something to me. So it was going on like for years like that. They just made my life hell, man. And it, and it was nothing I could do about it. Tired of being cloaked in suspicion, Michael can't wait for police any longer. He reaches out to a friend to help him clear his name. If something happened in Brighton Arms right there, the streets talk. I knew I couldn't go out there and get information from anybody because I'm not from there. So I knew he could. He called this guy over, and he told the guy, like, yo, this is my man's. He just want to know what happened to his wife. It's driving him crazy. We came back two days later, and the guy told me what happened. Michael's friend doesn't reveal the killer's names, but he does reveal crucial details about the night Janelle was killed. Michael wants to tell detectives what he's learned, but cooperating with police is risky. I truly believe it comes back to gang intimidation and people not wanting to come forward because either they don't trust the cops or they believe that the cops are going to put them in a bad predicament where certainly their lives and their family lives could be put at task. Do you feel nervous about talking to him? Not really, because at that point, if something would have happened to me, I didn't really care. Like, it was that part of life where, like, how, how worse, only thing worse was death. Despite the danger, Michael tells detectives what he's heard. According to Michael's source, the killers were not after Janelle on the night of the murder. So information had come off the street that individuals, gang members, were looking to rob a drug dealer named David Munch an individual who lived directly next to Janelle. He said that the guy that lived next door to her had $15,000 in a freezer and some drugs in the house. And the girlfriend was running her mouth at a party, and some stick-up kids heard her at the party. So they came to rob their house, and then they went to the wrong house. And then I guess they assumed that Janelle was the girlfriend. Now I knew that somebody else besides me knew I didn't have nothing to do with it. You get what I'm saying? Because people could say they believe you, but now somebody else besides me I knew knew that. Michael's cooperation with police might pay off. The theory that the killers went to the wrong apartment makes sense to investigators. The way Brighton Arms is set up, the apartments all look the same. Every window from every apartment is the same. It's extremely hard from that backside to identify what apartment is the exact apartment that you're looking for. Investigators now know the target was David James, AKA Munch. But that only gets them so far. They still have no idea who the killers are. We are working 12 hour days, but we were moving forward and documenting all the individuals we were speaking with. And I continued to hit the streets and my confidential sources that I had used in the past for information. Finally, the hard work pays off. An informant gives Sebas the names of three men who allegedly killed Janelle. The informant also says a fourth person, a woman, was the getaway driver. The information coming into me was that these individuals, Ebenezer Bird, Gregory Jean Baptiste, and Jerry Spraulding, with a female, committed this horrific homicide. They were in gangs, specifically the Bloods. The different sets were different at the times, but certainly Ebenezer Berg was running this group, and he continued to run the group when he was in prison. John Baptiste, 
Byrd and Spralding deny they had anything to do with the murder. As long as the three men stick to their stories, police can't charge them with anything unless they find a witness who can put them at the scene. Eventually, I get a phone call from a number on my phone that I don't recognize, and it's a family member from a girl named Norika Scott. Now, Norika Scott was also a girlfriend of Ebenezer Bird. According to Samus's informant, Ebenezer Bird is one of the three killers. If Bird and Norika Scott are in a relationship, there's a chance she could confirm the informant's story or even give Samus something else he could use to solve this murder. It was key for me to identify the driver who drove these individuals to the crime scene. You want to leave? Really? No, I don't want you to You want to go leave. home or you want to no. go to county? I don't really give a damn what happened. Detective Scott Samus and Matthew Quagliato want to question Narika Scott, the girlfriend of Ebenezer Bird. Bird is a suspect in Janelle Melton's murder. Bird is known to run with Gregory Jean Baptiste and Jerry Sprolding. According to an informant, the three men killed Janelle on September 13th, 2009. The men were allegedly driven to Janelle's apartment complex by a woman whose identity is still unknown. All three men deny involvement. Larika Scott's father brings her in. Her father's concerned because her father knows the relationship she has with Ebenezer Bird. Certainly, he knows the ups and downs that they've had. And he knows that this case has been the hot news. Do you need to talk? I'm here. I could have stayed home. They could have came Maybe you up. should step out because you're pissing me yeah, off. Don't, don't you're putting me under way more pressure than Just I'm already under in my ear, Dad. Do you understand how I'm feeling? Than you. The video speaks for itself. The video shows her cooperation, how scared she is. It's so important that you tell me the truth because she's relying on it. All right, I want you to look at it. I want you to understand, yeah, okay? Right. Narika said that when she was at a prison visit with Ebenezer Bird, he had confessed to her that him, Gregory Jean Baptiste, Jerry Spaulding, were involved in the murder of Janelle Melton. So he says it's him and Jerry Spaulding, and he's with a girl. Do you know the girl if I showed you a Elizabeth picture? Elizabeth Pinto. Elizabeth Pinto was a former girlfriend of Ebenezer Bird, and she turned out to be the key witness in this case. If Elizabeth Pinto was there when this crime took place, it was so important for us to corroborate this information if, in fact, she's the driver. Are you holding up? Mm -hmm. You all right? Matt and I bring her to one of the Perth Amboy Police Departments, and we go live. And probably the most important interview of my life. So tell me about in September, early September, what, what happens? You could see there's a little bit of fear in her eyes. Um, she is very trembly in her voice. She, she's very standoffish. She really doesn't want to talk about it. I'm just scared, Scott. Like, it's not easy to be so the whole, in my position. Do, do you believe that she deserves justice? Of course. Do you believe that they're, the husband and the mother and, their, and the sister deserve to know what happened? Of course. Once I broke her down, she finally said I was the driver. They all get dressed up in black as they, you know, done before, and they tell me to drop them off. I drop them Look, off at a location. Let me, let's slow it down a little bit. I, I go over with uh, pictures of these guys. Who's this? That's Ebenezer Bird. Who's this? Gregory Jean Baptiste. Who's this? Jerry Sprawling, you know? And you continue to have her ID these guys. Where did they tell you where they were going? Uh, they just told me to drive. They told me where to go. Is there anything else you wanted to add? I'm sorry that this happened to them. I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't say it sooner. Okay. When you're finally getting this years later, and you're thinking about Mike, and you're thinking about Janelle's mom and sisters, it's such a rush. That confession was huge, but it wasn't over with. Elizabeth Pinto pled to conspiracy. As part of her plea, she entered into an agreement. 
uh, through which that she had to cooperate. Bintu agrees to testify, and she even goes a step further. She offers to show Samus exactly what happened the night of the murder. During their ride along, Bento says that Bird, Jean-Baptiste, and Spalding put on latex gloves. From Pinto's description, they sound a lot like the gloves found at the crime scene. She said she parked up on the area where this white van is going now, and she says that she sees them walking across towards Brighton Arms right there. It's a direct path of where Brighton Arms 2 was and where Janelle Melton was living at the time. Elizabeth Pinto says that she stays there for a while, and then after approximately 10 to 15 minutes, all three individuals come back running. Pinto's tour establishes her as a rock-solid witness. Phone records also corroborate Pinto's account, placing Bird, Jean-Baptiste, and Spalding at Brighton Arms Apartments the night of the murder. It's enough for Samus and Quagliato to finally make an arrest. Today, prosecutors announced charges against three men in the cold case murder of a New Jersey teacher. Police say the men broke into the wrong apartment in the complex and encountered the woman inside. Gregory Jean-Baptiste, Jerry Sprouling, and Ebenezer Bird are charged with first-degree felony murder, second-degree robbery, conspiracy, and unlawful weapons charges. All three men maintain that they are innocent and are not responsible for the murder of Janelle Melton. They were going to be charged with felony murder based on the fact that she was killed in the course of a robbery. They broke into Janelle's apartment and were uh, attempting to rob her, and that's why she was killed. She was a, a valued member of the community, and no one deserves for this to happen to them. But of all people, it's the fact that it happened to Janelle, it's, 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 even, it's even worse. When this happened, it was like it reignited me, like, you know, like, I, my hope. Like, wow, you mean she could get justice? We knew this was the trial of our lifetime. We absolutely knew that. We came this far to make the arrests, and we wanted to put full justice for Janelle. Monmouth County prosecutors have a solid case. Their star witness and centerpiece is Elizabeth Pinto. She says she was with the three men the night of the murder and can put them at the scene. I'm walking, and then I see the three guys over here on the left. I see their attorneys, and then I see the jury. And then I go up and sit down, and it's just like, wow, this is real. The defendants had no connection to the victim whatsoever. In fact, they were in the wrong place. So they have a completely innocent victim who had nothing worth stealing in her apartment. She was not the target of any crime for any rational reason. It's so important that these witnesses testify. Given information is one thing, but getting on the stand and providing the truth and corroborated truth is a whole different story. Throughout the trial, there's contentious motions going on between the defense and the state. They tried to make it look like Mike Melton did it, and uh, that clearly didn't happen based on the evidence. Police tested so many different items of evidence and went through so much forensic testing, and yet still the defense is, well, what about this? They didn't test this, or they didn't do that. They, they could have done this. What if, you know, that type of thing. So we had to counteract that. The prosecutors then tell the jury what they believe happened the night Janelle was murdered. So the night of September 13th into September 14th, Janelle was home by herself. At that same time, Elizabeth Pinto is going over to Ebenezer Bird's mom's house in Asbury Park, where she finds Bird, Jean Baptiste, and Sprawling, getting ready for what they're about to do. They drive over, she parks the car, they tell her to wait for them. Two of them break in through the back. Jean Baptiste goes in through the window, drops the lighter, steps on the chair, leaves a footprint, and then walks down, opens a sliding glass door so the second person can get in. Now there's multiple of them in the apartment. They find Janelle in the bedroom, bind her, they hold her down. They're looking for money in Munch's freezer, and they're not finding it. And then finally, when they realize that they're in the wrong place, they shoot her in the, in the head, and they leave her for dead. DNA found on the lighter puts Gregory Jean Baptiste's at the scene. Phone records place all three men at Janelle's apartment complex on the night of the murder. 
and Elizabeth Pinto's eyewitness testimony ties everything together. What did you drive them to do? I drove them to, uh, I guess you could say, steal some money. Um, that was, that we, well not we, well, that they heard was in an apartment. And all three of them got out of the car and went on their way, you know, into the apartment complex. And I didn't see them for a little bit after that. Ebenezer Bird, Gregory Jean-Baptiste, and Jerry Spalding are all found guilty of first-degree murder, robbery, conspiracy, and weapons charges. A fourth man, James Fair, pleads guilty to conspiracy to commit burglary. James Fair was guilty for spreading the word to other gang members that there was money in David Munch's apartment. Once I heard the first guilty, I just knew that it was gonna be guilty, 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 guilty. Then it was just like, yes. I remember doing that fist bump thing, like, real happy, like, yes, like, it's over. And the verdict came down on my birthday. When I heard that verdict, it was like, yes, finally, like, final, finally, finally. When I heard it, I was at school, I couldn't contain myself. I ran into the principal's office, who had a relationship with Janelle and loved her, and I told her, and we just started hugging and crying. We just started hugging and crying. Gregory Jean-Baptiste, Ebenezer Bird, and Jerry Spalding are all sentenced to life in prison. Despite their convictions, all three men still claim to be innocent. In exchange for her cooperation, Elizabeth Pinto is allowed to plead guilty to conspiracy and is sentenced to probation. James Fair is currently serving an 82-year prison term from a previous conviction on 78 unrelated crimes. He is eligible for parole in 2065. On that day, 2009, two people died. Not only she died, but I died too because I wasn't the same person after that. It makes me feel like sad that I wasn't there to protect her. What people fail to realize, I got in this situation trying to do the right thing. I hit my bottom with alcoholism, and I had to go back to rehab. I found out I had a disease, and I did the steps. And I had my spiritual awakening. It totally changed my life. Like, I could, I could see the world different than I ever could see it before in my life. Once I got past the anger and I learned how to forgive, then I started learning how to forgive everybody in the situation. I miss Miss Melton, her laughter. I miss, you know, the jokes that she made. And to believe it or not, I mean, even though it was annoying sometimes, I miss when she used to play with my ears. I've succeeded. You know, I went off to college. I, I was, I made it. And I'm just like, I wish that she was here for me to share these experiences with her, to share these memories, to share these stories with her. She was somebody that I knew was in this world that knew me and still loved me. She always saw the best in people and she always saw their potential. I miss her. I guess I'll always miss her. Here, here we are, like 12 years, something like that. The pain and the anguish has diminished, but the missing her, that's still right there. It's right there.
Look at the flames. Listen to the coyotes yell. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Baraboo, Wisconsin. In 1899, the Midwest town housed the winter residence of the Ringling Brothers Circus. A century later, another circus is about to inhabit the sleepy town. But in this show, the main act is murder. Friday afternoon in Sauk County, Wisconsin. At 3.45, Detective Joseph Welch answers a call about a family finding a strange bag by the river. The mother was on the beach. They had come over and they were actually poking at um, what they had thought at the time was garbage. And they had, they had poked it open, told the mother that they had found something. Uh, she came back and looked and found that it was a human torso. A female torso wrapped in a black canvas bag. The remains are fresh, deposited on the beach within the past seven days. Search teams immediately begin patrolling the banks for the rest of the body. By Saturday morning, four more bags are recovered. Each contains a separate limb. When Detective Welch moves in for a closer look, the merely horrific turns bizarre. The femurs, both femurs were completely skinned. The legs, uh, or the uh, skin, along with the flesh was removed and that was found in a bag. Another very unique aspect of the body was how precisely this young lady was um, uh, dismembered. Special Agent Liz Fiegels views the disarticulation of the corpse as an investigative key, a window perhaps into the mindset of a killer. Disarticulation specifically refers to the taking apart at the joints as opposed to hacking or cutting. And it was done almost with surgical precision. On Saturday afternoon, 24 hours after the torso was discovered, search teams find the victim's head amidst a thicket of brush on the river's north bank. When it's placed next to the recovered arms and legs, the investigation takes yet another twist. The skin from the face was actually removed. Uh, there was no skin on the, the face at all, and the scalp, along with the nose, was removed from the uh, skull. It completely precluded her identity, at least for uh, uh, a facial recognition. You know, there's no way that you could have shown this photograph to anybody and had any sort of compassion or concern for them as possible surviving victims of their loved one. A skull without a face. Whoever killed the young woman clearly did not want her identified. Fiegels and Welch believe if they can find the identity of their Jane Doe, she will lead them to her killer. On the first floor of the State Historical Society, behind the banners and colonnades, dwells the Indian Burial Department. Inside, forensic anthropologist Leslie Eisenberg studies the art of reading bones. Most of her specimens date back hundreds of years. Occasionally, however, she is called upon to read the tea leaves in an active murder investigation. One of the ways that forensic anthropologists can contribute to a case that's otherwise unidentifiable is to provide information on the sex of the individual, the age of the individual, um, the stature, and the ancestry. Eisenberg is asked to examine the Jane Doe remains. Based on my examination and measurements of various bones, um, the height was estimated at between five feet and five foot four. Um, the age, in my opinion, was 18 to 24, and uh, ancestry was African American. Eisenberg's findings provide detectives with their first toehold in the investigation. Jane Doe's profile is cross-referenced against missing persons from across the country. Now, certainly we had to notify all uh, law enforcement nationwide using um, the teletype system. Then we entered her parameters, unide unidentified deceased victim in NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, for any possible, what we'd call hits, of similar missing 
females. The remains of the victims show evidence of decapitation. And then we also used a press conference to get our information out to the community and get leads coming in, at least locally. The story gets local, then national play. A phone bank is set up. Over 1,000 hits are registered. All potential leads on missing black females. Detectives quickly realize they need more detailed information on their Jane Doe if the investigation is to go forward. Specifically, they need to put a face to their skull. Giving them the information that this was a female black, giving them the height and weight was not going to give us a lot of information at all. It was that we needed to actually have a, a physical photograph that people could look at on a poster to attempt to identify this person. Detectives want to undertake a facial reconstruction of the skull. The problem is, it's a procedure that requires boiling any existing soft tissue off the bone. That's a step County Prosecutor Pat Barrett does not want to take. In order to do clay reconstruction, you need a naked skull, and we didn't have a naked skull. We also didn't know if we had anything of evidentiary value with the flesh itself. Uh, because we didn't know necessarily what weapons uh, may have been used to do that, we didn't know what we would miss by taking any of that flesh away. Unwilling to chance destroying critical evidence, Barrett refuses to allow the skull to be stripped for facial reconstruction. Fiegels and Welch are forced to return to the initial phone leads for missing persons. The volume is overwhelming. In 1999, over 100,000 missing black females were registered nationwide. The chances of matching one to the detective's Jane Doe, especially without a picture or sketch of the victim, are slim to none. In time, the case of the dismembered torso goes cold. I believed that it was going to be virtually impossible to solve. And as time went on and we didn't have a missing victim being reported anywhere, and um, we had not been able to find a fingerprint match. I thought, you know, this probably never will be solved. In the summer of 1999, a female body is found along the banks of the Wisconsin River. The victim's head is missing its face, making identification impossible. Traditional face reconstruction requires removing all flesh from the skull and reducing it to bone. It's a step the district attorney is unwilling to take for fear of destroying critical soft tissue evidence. The case goes cold and remains cold until one day when detectives happen upon a group of engineers working out of a lab in Milwaukee. Well, it's not every day that as an engineering professor that uh, you get a call asking if you can help solve a murder. Bob Crockett works in the basement of the Milwaukee School of Engineering, home to an emerging technology called rapid prototyping. The basic idea of rapid prototyping is to take a computer model, anything that you can draw on the computer or import from medical data. A skull, perhaps. A skull is a good example. Usually we do industrial parts, things like engine blocks and things that people design. Three dimensions makes all the difference. So you took an industrial technology and created something that we can use forensically. That's right. This is so cool. It is. It's really neat technology. Using rapid prototyping, Crockett is able to make an exact replica of the skull without removing any of the soft tissue the DA wants to preserve. Well, we received a data disk from the sheriff's department that had a CAT scan of the victim's head. And then you sent uh, the information to the machine? All the data was, was sent to the machine, which sliced it up into probably about 10,000 different layers. And when you do that enough times, you've actually built up, layer by thin layer, a physical object. So each layer of paper represents a slice of the CAT scan, is that right? Uh, actually, each layer of paper is quite a bit thinner than the CAT scan slice. A CAT scan typically pulls information out one millimeter at a time. Mm -hmm. So we've actually used our computer in this case to, to interpolate, to actually smooth out the CAT scan images to get a better representation of the actual skull. After 30 hours of processing, Crockett's machine has built up enough layers of paper to recreate the victim's skull. And after all the layers are bonded together, you have something that looks like this. It feels like wood, and it looks like it's absolutely made to detail. 
Yeah. I think the, uh, the feature definition is about one thousandth of an inch. It's an identical replica to the actual skull. When I actually saw the skull, I was amazed. I thought it, it looked exactly like a actual skull. All the proportions down to the teeth, um, the eye sockets, everything was exactly the way a, an actual skull would look like. Welch drives the skull to Lexington, Kentucky, in the office of Dr. Emily Craig, a world-renowned expert in the field of clay reconstruction. Welch presents the rapid prototype skull to Dr. Craig. I thought it was really well done. Since it was made with layers of paper, you could still see the layers, and so it was like a topographical map of the entire skull. The next day, Dr. Craig begins the process of building a face from the skull. These are basically the ingredients that we use, the materials that we use for doing a 3D facial reconstruction. Craig uses a knife, erasers, glue, and clay. Her most important tool, however, cannot be found on the shelves of any store. The best tools I have are right here. Craig starts by consulting an anthropological chart for the typical tissue depths of a young black female. Using the erasers, she plots these out on the skull. And those were then glued on the skull at these specific places. And then I simply uh, connected the dots in three dimension with clay and built the face up according to this particular victim's skull structure. Craig then moves from skin tissue to eyes. The eyes have to be there first, and working on a correct gaze is actually one of the hardest aspects of doing a facial reconstruction. Once the eyes are set, it's like, okay, now let's do the rest. The rest takes three days to complete. Three days Dr. Craig spends alone, relying on an innate sense of feel to reveal Jane Doe's identity. As a matter of fact, the final stages of the reconstruction I actually do with my eyes closed. So I'm, I'm feeling the contours and seeing if it's symmetrical. Some people say it's a little bit of clairvoyance to kind of think how this person would look. And when I'm doing a facial reconstruction, I almost hate to say this because it makes me sound like so much of an artist, but it just has to feel right. On September 16th, it feels right. It's an approximation created to suggest the victim's facial contours and the proportions of the facial features. Dr. Craig presents her approximation of Jane Doe to cold case detectives. It was phenomenal. I expected a Gumby sort of clay uh, figure that would not at all look human. This actually looked like, like a photograph of a person. Four different photographs are taken. Each showing the same clay model in a slightly different way, with longer hair or glasses. It really personalized the case for both Detective Welch and myself when we could see this young lady's face. The pictures are placed on posters and distributed around the world. It would be two more months, however, before cold case detectives get the break they need, but it would happen less than 100 miles away. Winter in western Wisconsin. On a Wednesday afternoon, nurse practitioner Sherry Goss makes a routine stop at the local grocery store. I stopped at the cash machine at the front of the grocery store and looked at a poster out of the corner of my eye and saw what I thought was a picture of Moivano. It just struck me very immediately that that was her. Her name is Mlivano Kupaza. In 1997, the 23-year-old Tanzanian lived with Goss and her husband in Madison. It's been a year since Goss last saw the foreign student. When she first sees the poster, Goss thinks it's a photograph of Mlivano. Then she reads the details. Very upsetting. And I tried to convince myself that it couldn't be true. But I was quite convinced that it was her very frightened. Goss provides cold case detectives with Muivano's name, but precious little information about the young woman's whereabouts. 
The team checks with immigration, but can find no identifying information on Muivano to check against their Jane Doe. Cold case detective Welch then discovers that Muivano had attended an English language school during her time in medicine. He goes there with a hunch. We had known that she had handled documents at the um, school that she had attended, so we took those documents, submitted them to the crime lab, and the crime lab was able to develop prints from those. The prints are compared with lifts taken from the corpse. They're a match. The victim, who for so long has just been a skull, now has a face and a name, Muivano Kupaza. Detective Welch receives the news while in his car. I was driving down the roadway and I almost went into the ditch. It was an unbelievable feeling. I was extremely elated, I guess, that we at least knew who she was and had a place to start. Then, of course, the investigation takes a whole different angle. You can't really do productive investigation until you know who your victim is. A corpse without a face is found along the banks of the Wisconsin River. Months later, the female victim is still unidentified, the case cold. Technology, however, is able to replicate the skull, providing the victim with first a face and then a name, Muivano Kupaza from Tanzania. She had come to medicine in 1997 to live with her cousin, 37-year-old Peter Kupaza, and his wife, Sherry Goss. You know, I think she was excited about coming here and furthering her education. She wanted to study so that she could have a good job back in Tanzania. Sherry Goss and Peter Kupaza welcomed the Tanzanian woman into their home. At first, the arrangement seemed to work. Then Peter Kupaza began to change. Seemed to be very kind and uh, caring. Um, through our time together, I found that that was not his true character, um, that he tended to manipulate and um, control a lot, that he was very concerned about himself above all other people. According to Goss, Kupaz's desire for control turned into anger, which eventually gave way to violence. In July of 1997, Sherry Goss moved out, and Wivano Kupaza followed, but she didn't stay away for long. She wanted to continue to go to school, so she went to stay with friends of hers and I believe went back to live with Peter. Aware of Kupaza's capacity for violence, Sherry Goss warned Muivano not to return to her cousin. The warning, however, did not take. I was very concerned, but it was a difficult time uh, in my relationship with Peter, so I, I didn't see her again. The next time Goss does see Muivano, is on a police poster about a murdered woman. I knew that he was capable of harm and cruelty, but I didn't feel that it would extend to um, murder, particularly of a family member. On reflection, I decided that it was within his capacity. Gus shares her concerns with cold case detectives, and Peter Kupaza jumps to the top of their suspect list. They decide it's time to talk with the man who last saw their victim alive. January 31st, 7.30 p.m. Detective Welch and Agent Fiegels approach a townhome complex in Madison, Wisconsin. They are there to execute a search warrant for the home of Peter Kupaza. As they ring apartment 107, Kupaza answers the door. We showed him the reconstruction. I asked him if it looked like anyone that he had ever seen before. He had said, no, it does not. Everybody else we showed that poster to didn't miss a beat and says, that looks just like Movano. I asked him if it actually looked like Movano, and he said, no, it does not. He's the only person we talked to who said it did not look like Movano. Cold case detectives press Kupaza for details. He said she went back to Tanzania on April 25th of 1999. As he talks, one fact makes itself clear. Peter Kupaza is lying. He said that her father called him, said that she returned to Tanzania 
that he had picked her up at the airport and she arrived safely. We knew none of that was true. A suspect who lies is good. In a homicide investigation, hard evidence is even better. Inside Kupaz's apartment, cold case detectives find the murdered young woman's clothes, her jewelry, and her hymnal. In the upstairs bathroom, the first hint of murder. Behind the baseboard, technicians find a drop of blood measuring half an inch. DNA testing matches it to Wivano. One drop of blood, however, is a slim reed upon which to rest a charge of murder. Cold case detectives want more. They bring in Eagle, a dog trained to search for blood. He hits on multiple spots in Kupaz's home and garage. Well, as you can see, this garage accommodates about 28 vehicles, and there were only about eight in here at the time. And um, virtually after, immediately after um, entering the garage, she let him off leash, and Eagle, um, she sent him to search, and he immediately uh, alerted on Peter Kupaz's vehicle, which was then parked in this stall. Eagle's alert convinces cold case detectives Kupaza is their killer. On January 31st, he is arrested and taken to Sauk County Jail to await trial on a charge of murdering his cousin. On June 12th, Peter Kupaza stands trial for the murder of his cousin, Wivano. Watching from the front row of the courtroom sits Mwivano's parents. They are also the accused's aunt and uncle. Pat Barrett delivers the prosecution's opening statement. Our case to the jury uh, basically was is that she was a young woman who came here and was, to the best of our knowledge, totally dependent on Peter Kupaza. And that Peter Kupaza lied about things that he had no reason to lie about when law enforcement contacted him, lies that were proven to be lies. Kupaza enters a plea of not guilty. This has been going on in my heart. <laughs> I don't know what to say, but I would like to tell you today that I did not do this. His defense focuses not on what the prosecution has, but on what is missing. Certainly the defense was uh, the obstacles. You don't have a cause of death. You don't have a motive. You don't have a manner of death. You don't have any weapons. Um, you don't have any smoking gun. What the prosecution does have is Wivano's blood found in Peter Kupaza's bathroom. Barrett contends this is where Kupaza killed Wivano and then drained her blood in the bathtub. Central to the state's case is the work of the specialized canine, Eagle. The dog hit on every place the lab had already found blood, but it also hit on a lot of other locations where we could not visually detect anything. But we knew the dog was hitting on areas where there in fact was blood. Now just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. The dog has certainly a much stronger sense of smell than we have a sense of vision. For the jury to find Kupaza guilty, they must believe Eagle can and did detect blood throughout the suspect's home. The first item I'll be using is going to be beef blood. To illustrate that point, cold case detectives provide the court with a demonstration. Be soaking the handkerchief in the blood. Detective Welch soaks a series of cloths, one in beef blood and then another in pig's blood. The final one that we're using is going to be human blood. Welch then takes one drop of human blood, puts it on a third piece of cloth, and then washes the cloth in cold water. Okay. And washed out. Using a... Welch and Barrett place three brown bags containing the different blood samples in separate areas of the courtroom. Eagle. Eagle the dog is then brought in and asked yeah. to locate the human blood. The canine walks past the bags containing the animal blood and alerts on the cloth containing human blood. And show me where exactly. Eagle. This compelling demonstration, taken together with the blood evidence found in Kupaza's home and car, his inability to answer questions about Muivano's whereabouts, and the fact the accused was the last person to see the victim alive, comprises the prosecution's case for murder. After nine hours of deliberation, the jury agrees that the case is sufficient and finds Peter Kupaza 
guilty of murder in the first degree, he sentenced to life in prison. When the verdict was read, I had no idea Joe was doing this, but I was doing it at the same time. They polled each individual juror, is this how you voted? And they said, yes, yes, yes. Joe and I looked at each one of them and mouthed the words, thank you, thank you, thank you. Neither one of us knew that the other was doing it. Like so many others, Muivano Kupaza came to America a stranger. Like so many others, she trusted in the people she knew best, her family. Peter Kupaza repaid that trust with a violent and brutal death cutting short the young woman's life and her dreams. Wivano Kupaza did not, however, die without a champion. Cold case investigators who took up her case to discover first who she was and then who was her killer. Wivano was buried in a cemetery close to Sherry Goss's home, the woman who knew Wivano the best during her brief time in America. Her friend's memory may have been put to rest, but it will never be forgotten. Oh, I try very hard to remember um, her smiling and happy and um, um, laughing. She's a very sweet person. Uh, that's my best memory of her, and I struggle really hard to keep her on living in my heart. Just south of San Francisco sits the county of San Mateo, home to the wealth of Silicon Valley. Here, land is gold, with million-dollar homes shoehorned onto tiny lots, each lot part of another block, each block eating away at the natural beauty of Northern California. John Dellinges is an arson investigator for the Woodside Fire Department. This was really an open land area, a lot of farms and horses and and uh, sheep up here. Uh, they were like little ranches, country, you know, type homes. And now all of a sudden, the area's being built up with brand new big homes, 4,000 to 6,000 square foot. As the hammers fall and the wood is cut, resentment builds in the area, and new housing starts to burn. All of the houses were under construction. Uh, we had a total of 11 fires that were uh, all similarity in, in, in sets and all in the same vicinity, some on the same street. Seven new homes in the span of 12 months burnt to the ground. Fortunately, no one is hurt, but losses are in the millions. Dellinger's videotapes each of the fires and studies them, hoping to discern a pattern. Messages scrawled on the walls provide him with his first clue. There were handwritten messages written on the walls, uh, neighbors revolt, no more homes. Experienced arsonists, number one, they don't leave clues. And there were a lot of things that were left at the scene that indicated to us that juveniles were involved in it. A task force of state and local officials is formed. Dellinger's begins nightly stakeouts of the neighborhood. Kirk Landyke from the California Department of Forestry provides backup. We kind of felt that it was taking on a little bit of a, a dangerous tone. I mean, we had somebody that was very open about burning these homes down and, and was straightforward about it. You know, they just stepped up and, and burned these places. In 1988, the spree continues. Four more homes set on fire, bringing the total to 11 destroyed in the area. And one of the houses that was under construction that was uh, set on fire was occupied. People were asleep, smelled the smoke, called us, and we got there, and the, the owners had extinguished the fire. As neighbors watch their homes burn, fear ripens into suspicion, and the community begins to turn on itself. Everybody was suspicious of everybody, and everybody was uh, saying, hey, I think my neighbor might be doing this. There was a lot of pressure put on everybody to get something going here, and it was, and we just weren't able to really identify something. We kept up the patrols and, and the uh, and the nighttime surveillance work, but we're still unable to uh, find anybody that was responsible for setting these fires. After three years of investigation, the team is still no closer to finding their arsonist. Frustration takes root, and fresher cases are given priority. 
By May of 1990, the task force has dwindled to a precious few, and the San Mateo Fires case goes cold. Highway 205, some 50 miles north of San Mateo County. A truck breaks down. A father and son got out to make repairs. The fellow broke down about where that pickup is, and he was going to come to this house that's over here to use the phone. The boy sees an army jacket bundled in some bushes along the side of the road. And he kind of come in here and he kicked it. And when he did, the cassette tapes and the videotape fell out of the jacket. The boy picks up the tape and brings it home. This is the tape the family sees and hears. Look at the fire. When they got home, the uh, father was viewing the videotape, and uh, he stated that it scared him to death. The family takes the tape to police and eventually to George Wells, a fire investigator for San Joaquin County. When I first saw it, uh, I immediately thought that we were dealing with somebody that was very disturbed. Hell, my hell. The whole sky is black with smoke. The house captured on the video is fully involved with fire. The narrator and person making the tape claims to have also set the fire. I told you I'll do it. Wells concludes the blaze is not one his department is investigating. The mysterious tape is then sent out to fire conferences across the state and eventually to San Mateo County and investigator John Delanges. An investigator called us from Santa Clara County saying, hey, we have this tape, we want to bring it to your task force. I went to Sacramento, retrieved the tape, brought it back to San Mateo County, and early in the morning, we viewed it and uh, went from there. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. This is hell. At first, the task force has little luck in identifying the house or fire as one of the San Mateo fires. Engine 7, Battalion 2, Command. Then Dellinger remembers the videotapes he had made as part of his investigation into each of the fires. Frame by frame, he compares his tapes against the mysterious video. What I did was I, I took their tape, I set it up on a, on a TV screen, and I set my tape, the fire department tape, on a TV screen and looked at them both. He viewed a lamp post, uh, a PG&E power pole, a trailer that began to, to pop up. The telephone pole and trailer. Highlighted in these frames of video are the keys for Dellinger's, who pinpoints the house as one of the first to burn in Redwood City. Dellinger's revisits the site and comes to a chilling realization. Whoever videotaped the blaze had stood behind a screen of bushes less than 50 feet from Dellinger's on the night of the fire. The fire department is trying to put it out. To have somebody who is setting fires and hiding up in the bushes behind me filming the same fire that I'm filming, and I've never, ever had this happen to me before. Look at the flames. Listen to the coyotes yell. <laughs> After three years, this bizarre tape has given cold case investigators their first real break in the case. They believe whoever made the video either set the San Mateo fires or knows who did. Look at the fire. Isn't it beautiful? Look at it. This tape found wrapped inside a coat along the side of a California freeway has breathed new life into the hunt for what cold case investigators believe to be a serial arsonist. This case was, was very unusual and incredibly interesting from our standpoint because of that mechanism of the tape, geographically where it was found and how it came back to us. Um, that was a pretty amazing thing in itself. I said I'll do it. I said I'll do it. The narrator on the tape appears to be claiming responsibility for setting the fire. Cold case investigators reach out to the public in an effort to put a name to that voice. We had another task force meeting. We said, we know where the fire was, um, and it's tied into all of our other fires. So therefore, we decided we were going to put it on television. On September 9th, Unsolved Mysteries airs the mysterious video. 
San Joaquin Fire Investigator George Wells is in Los Angeles, where they field more than 1,800 phone calls. The phone calls came from all the way from Australia, Canada, uh, throughout the United States. A lot of weird phone calls, psychics and all this. During the last 30 minutes of the show's feed, the team gets five calls, all from San Mateo County. It was either the third or the fourth call where somebody called in and they even described a young man. That caller is Doris Lance, a neighbor in the area. We were sitting watching Unsolved Mysteries. I was looking at it and looking at it, and it looked just like the fire we watched burn, you know, a year or so earlier. Dear feet, Omar, I told you I'll do it. Lance believes the name mentioned might very well belong to her 17-year-old neighbor. Look at it, Omar. <laughs> she said it was a kid that lived across the street whose name was Omar. So that name was a concern to us because that was a name that was used on tape. Cold case investigators decide to talk to Lance's 17-year-old neighbor to discover if he is the person mentioned on the video, and if so, why? Redwood City Police Detective Mark Polio questions the boy. Initially, this youth uh, denied any knowledge or involvement in the arson or the taping of the fire. The 17-year-old is brought into the police station and questioned further. In short order, his story begins to crumble. We pressured him a little more, and eventually he did admit uh, that he did know about it. Uh, had not seen the tape until it was aired on TV, though, but his friend who burnt the house had told him he did videotape it. The boy gives Polio the name of a second youth, an 18-year-old who investigators believe actually made the video and perhaps set the house on fire. Police put this second youth under surveillance. Before they could act, however, the suspect's garage goes up in flames, providing Dulleges and Landyke with a free look inside the suspect's house. And while investigating uh, that particular fire, we came across some evidence that was disturbing to us. We found animal parts. We found uh, what appeared to be, um, you know, I, I hate, I, I don't want to say sacrifices, but we found things that led us to believe that, there thing, that animals were being uh, cut apart, were being sacrificed. We found uh, a cutting table with a big blade. We found knives with blood on them. We found uh, a Freddy Krueger mask, Freddy Kruger fingers it was a concern to us at this time that uh, the kid that lived here needed some help. Definitely put him as a number one suspect. On September 27th, 1990, they bring the 18-year-old into the station for questioning. He broke down and cried and eventually started admitting that he had committed this one arson. Inside the boy's home, they find more tapes and more evidence that he may have been involved in more than just one fire. The arsonist's message spray-painted on the wall. Please. Home video documents the boy's fascination with television coverage of the fires. There's also a scrapbook of sorts, a collection of newspaper clips on the fires. What we find in serial arson-type cases is the suspect will document uh, his acts in some way, keep newspaper articles, write a diary, what have you. But in the age of uh, the video camcorder, uh, we're finding that more often suspects will use that to videotape their feats. And in this case, I believe the suspect just wanted to document what he was doing to maybe uh, perhaps relive it later or just, just have fun. But his fun appears to extend beyond a mere video diary. How you doing, father? <laughs> Sifting through the collection of tapes, cold case investigators happen upon a fascination with violence and satanic images. I'm on my way to get that fat son of a b and I'm gonna kill him. He had videos of him wearing bizarre outfits. Um, one in particular was he was dressed up as Dracula and he had a picture behind, uh, behind him looking at it saying, you're next. I'm hungry tonight. Because tonight is a night 
where all evil and satanic worshippers come, where Satan rises again and fulfills the destiny of hatred and evil and sin. <laughs> the kid was uh, definitely needed some help. And now to finish the job. This final tape provides police with what they believe to be a motive for the fires. A home video of two of the boys questioned in the case, playing army in Edgewood Park near the scene of the fires. According to cold case investigators, it was this park that the 18-year-old felt compelled to protect, and in doing so, almost burned the neighborhood to the ground. This was their neck of the woods. This was their, their area. They were had played in there, they had done military games, they had uh, done sacrificial kinds of uh, um, ceremonies out there. They uh, pretty much didn't like this area being developed. And uh, that is the reason for him setting these fires. This is my domain. Although investigators feel certain the 18-year-old was responsible for the string of fires in San Mateo County, they allow him to plead guilty to a single count of arson. Their focus more on rehabilitation than punishment. We also felt that the way the kids were going and the road that they were going down could easily have escalated to something else. Your house is next! <laughs> in this case, we were able to uh, identify him, stop him, and get him treatment, so hopefully uh, it will never happen again. Today, this section of San Mateo County is quiet. The development boom has slowed, but not subsided. For fire investigator John Dellinger's, this area has been home for most of his adult life. He's seen a change, seen it grow, and seen the pains that come with growth. Dellinger's views his job as a simple one, to serve and protect. In the case of the San Mateo arson fires, it was a responsibility he did not take lightly nor relinquish easily. Our agency attributes the success of the case to Captain Dellinger's out of Woodside, and uh, he refused to let go of it. It was an investigation I wasn't going to close, and my job was to stay on as long as I had to in order to solve it. <laughs> 